was. Take your Bible and go with me to Acts chapter 1, if you will. In Acts chapter 1, we're going to read just a few verses. I'm not going to take a long time to read through uh, a lot of this chapter. We'll just touch on little bits and pieces of it. <clears throat> the scene, I hope, this, I hope this will make sense to you. The scene is simply this. There is a band of Christians followers of Christ who are literally huddled together in a room praying for something to happen. Does that make sense? I think a lot of times we try to make it more than what it has to be made out to be. Essentially what's taking place is that Christ has told the disciples that he will meet them there. And you know for the child of God today if we would pay close attention to what Christ has told us there's a promise that where two or three are gathered together in my name, going to meet you right there. And I'm so glad that he still meets with his people. The scene in, in this passage of Scripture is that very thing that the disciples have met together. They're in, the, in this room, and uh, they begin to pray. Now, ultimately what happens to us as we as God's people begin to pray... We pray with an anticipation, but not always for the right thing. The Bible talks about how that some pray amiss. So they pray many times for their own gain, for their own... For, in other words, we're not praying that the Lord... Thy, you know, Jesus said that. He said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that was the, the leading prayer. That's when the disciples came and they said, Teach us how to pray. And so he says, Well, when, when you pray, here's what you're praying. One of the things that he prayed was, when in teaching them, was that when you pray, you ought to be praying that God's will be done, not your own. And so the disciples, by, by example of this in Acts chapter 1, have met together now, and when they begin to pray, they begin to pray that the power of God would so move upon them that great things would happen. I'm just dumb enough to believe God can still do that today. I'm just of the mind and of the opinion that if there was a group of disciples of Christ today that would meet together and pray with such anticipation to see the power of God move, that it would happen. And I know that we talk about having a, a revival that, that, that goes worldwide. And, I, and I'm, I'm a firm believer that if God so desired that happen, that He certainly could make that happen. But I also don't believe that it will happen until there's a band of Christians that gather together and they allow it to happen and begin in their own heart. Because revival is not, and I, I know I say this all the time, but revival is not when the preacher preaches the message. Revival is not the evangelist that shows up and we don't open the magic box. Revival is not because you have great songs. Revival is not because of the choir. What power the choir can sing about and all. That's not revival. Revival is truly when the life of the child of God who has anticipated the move of God allows the power of God to work in them, through them, and we begin to preach or proclaim that message by our own life. When you walk out in the world and the world says there's something different about those people, it's pretty evident to somebody that God's doing something. When we pray, and I've heard this said several times, Lord, I pray that my life would not just be a, a depiction of Christianity, would be a, be a depiction of Christ. Because let's face it, the world has got a multitude of definitions of what Christianity could be or possibly might be today. And I think that if we would start relaying the message of Christ once again, that real revival could take place. Something happens in the book of Acts that changes the whole scenario of what goes on. It's not just the fact that they met to pray, because certainly they do that, and we'll read a little bit about that tonight. They do meet to pray, and I also believe that they did anticipate God to do so. I mean, he promised he's going to show up, and he certainly does. But he also promised some other things that were going to happen too. And I think a lot of times we, we say, well, we want this, the big picture of all of this. I said this morning to the church, uh, we were down in Payson at Brother, Brother Boykin's church. I said, you know, a lot of times churches begin to pray that God will do something great in their church, but they're not willing to do what it takes to get that to happen. 
So we want God to do His work, His magic, if you will, to, to, par, to borrow the pun. But we're not willing to do the part that God's commanded us to do, to get that. I'm very thankful that we started that song out in prayer tonight. Uh, I, I think that that ought to happen more in our churches today. No revival has ever come in the history of our country or our world until somebody got on their face before Almighty God and just cried out to God. This afternoon we sat across the table from a young couple and uh, going through some hard things in their life and they began to share some of the circumstances that brought them to the church that they're in now, Brother Boykin's church, and, and what, what they had gone through and all of that. And that dear lady sat there and she just wept in front of me. And you know what, I'll be honest with you, it was very, I couldn't even look at her. Because, and Julie even said to her, the reason he can't look at you right now is because he understands how you feel. And, and it would have been to where I could not have even spoken to her anymore. I was so heartbroken for her that I just was going to just fall apart myself. But you know, I think we're at a place today that we need to let our mascara run a little bit. We've so painted on Christianity today and painted on this religious uh, a form of godliness today that we forgot that what's on the inside is Christ and Christ wants to come out in us. In Acts chapter 1, notice this with me in verse 1. The Bible says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that, he was, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. By many infallible proofs. He showed up by many infallible proofs. It's not a guess. It's not a, a, a myth. It's not a, what. well, maybe he didn't. He proved himself to them. He says, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them. By the way, he, he promised he was going to show up and then he kept his word. He showed up. It says, commanded them, didn't suggest to them, but commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, he say, which saith he, ye have heard of me. So in other words, he just gets done telling them this. Now look, here we are, I'm meeting with you, but i got to tell you this. You promised me that you're going to wait right here until the stuff I told you was going to happen, happens. That's when it's time to move. I think a lot of times, don't we get it in our head, well, we'll just go ahead and do what we want to do and then have God catch up to us when we're ready. God says, look, you better wait until I tell you to move. When it's time to go, that would be the time to go. Then in verse 5, he says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore, or when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? I'm so thankful they asked that. Brother Rod, that means it was on their heart. Do you know, they didn't, get, they didn't meet with Christ and then ask a question of, well, what's in it for me? Well, if I wait here and, I, and you've made me all these promises of these great miracles that are going to happen, well, what's, what about me? What's going to happen to me? What's going to be in the... He didn't ask. They said this. You know that stuff that you talked about, about Israel and the kingdom? Is that going to happen now? Hey, do you know that Jesus Christ has promised that revival can still happen in the lives of God's people today? Can you imagine what prayer would be like if God's people met with God and their prayer began to be, God, is this the time that revival is going to break out? Not, God, would you give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, and don't forget that, 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 and that. But can you imagine what it would be like if God's people started saying, Lord, could this be the time? I'm so anticipating great things to happen. I'm, how about now? What about now? What about now? You know, oftentimes we claim that as waiting for the rapture to take place, and I can't wait for the catching away of the saints to happen. 
What about the other, the other promises God made that God could still move by His power, the Spirit of God, within the local church today? How about now? What about now? Tonight? Could it be in us tonight? Lord, it's not about all my wants and my desires. You promised all those things too. But what about the moving of the Spirit of God right now? Can you imagine what kind of church revival could take place if our focus was on the kingdom of God? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Not your own. God, make me holy. Make me right. Make me, make me, make me. What if we sought the righteousness of God first? Do you know, God, you are right. And because of that, and you in me, makes me right. There was a book that came out, I think, called I Am Second. What would it be like if God's people today would take the second seat to God and quit putting the bumper sticker on and says, God's the co-pilot? What if God was actually the pilot? What if we took the second seat and we started seeking the righteousness of God? Lord, I want to see, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then all these things shall be added unto you. What change could happen in the local church today? What change could happen in missions today? What change could happen that there not have to be a missionary show up and beg and plead, please help me get there. But instead, the local church mindset would be, let's find someone and just send them. Now, I can't say that I would be 100% behind the fact that we would just choose out somebody and say, like it or not, you're going. But you know God does that. God looks at people. Oh, he looked at Jonah, didn't he? By the way, you're going. Jonah said, I might not. The Lord said, yeah, I think you will. I got a feeling that it's going to be the hard way, but you're going to go anyway. I don't want to go that way. I'd rather it just go ahead and be on my heart to go, just to go ahead and surrender. The Bible says this in verse 5 again. Notice this with me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? In verse 7, he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Now listen to this. If words are important and letters are important, he didn't just say there was just going to be, eh, that's it. He said it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, plural. Which means that the power of God is not going to just all at once, later on at one day, just show up and go, well, it's over. But there's going to be a time now and a time then and a time then and a time then. And there's going to be season here and season here and season here in our life when the Spirit of God is so going to move that we're going to grow. Because what we know today is not what we knew 10 years ago. What we know today, we've grown in the power of God and we begin to move forward in our growth in the local church. And God knew that about those disciples. They said, Lord, we want to know everything. He said, you don't, it's not time for you to know all that. See, there's going to be some seasons. And then he says this. But. In other words, however. Ye shall receive power. Hey, that's a pretty cool thing. <clears throat> Do you know that what they prayed was they said, Lord, could we have it right now? He said, it's not time yet. All that stuff about my kingdom, and all, it's not, it's, it's not, you don't need to know all that, right? It's not time for you to know all that. However, I want you to know this. You're going to get power. That gives us something to look forward to. These disciples are not going, well, that's it. You know, it's not like a to-be-continued thing. It's a promise. Right now, this is what you know. But you're going to get the answer. He says, but 
Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. Remember, before this, he just got done telling them, Now look, you promised me you're going to stay here. You read that. You promised me you stay right where you are until the Holy Spirit comes on you. But when that happens, I promise you this, you are going to have the power to take this message, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, to the Samarias, to the uttermost part of the earth. I'm so glad that Jesus Christ saves to the uttermost. You know, you probably heard it too, but there's a preacher that preached a message entitled, From the Guttermost to the Uttermost. You could turn that right around and preach about the prodigal son just opposite, from the uttermost to the guttermost, and then back again. Man, I'm glad that's the God we serve. Would you look down with me a little bit farther? The Bible says, verse 13, when they were come in, they went up to an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, the son of Zeloti, Simon Zeloti, the, uh, Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Here's an interesting thought before we go on. You know that everybody, minus one, Everybody that I've read in those names right there all have a very shady past. All except Mary, the mother of Jesus. I can't find anything shady about that gal. Must have been a reason that God chose her. I'm not saying she's perfect. She's still flesh and bone. But I know this. There was something that set her apart from all the others. But I can sure take you through the Bible and show you there's a whole lot of mess in everybody else's life. And yet those are the very ones that Jesus said, you guys are the ones going to get the power. Aren't you glad that God uses the gutter most? Aren't you glad that God doesn't look at you and say, you're not good enough to be... Uh, in that church. You're not good enough to be a missionary. You're not good enough. Hey, brother, you know what? I don't know about you. I don't know about your past and all that, but God does. Aren't you glad God didn't look at you and, and you're surrendering yourself to missions and all of that? And God say, I'm sorry. I got somebody better than over, over here. Instead, God says, if you're willing, you're the one I want. You're the very one I want. Well, tonight I want to tell you this, that what we've been reading about in this passage of Scripture did something so phenomenal that it's the very thing that I'm praying will happen in this church, at Faith Baptist Church. And I'll tell you what it is. God used a bunch of wicked people to shake an entire city. I mean, they got things stirred up. They caused such a stir around that a bunch of them lost their lives. Now, I'm not praying God will kill all of us. There'll be no Kool-Aid at the end of this service. But I can promise you this. If Jesus had told them to drink the Kool-Aid, they'd have said, how much sugar do you want in it? Or it might have been sweet tea. It might have been one of those. I don't know. But I'll tell you this. Whatever God was doing in them is what we need in our churches today. Something happened that caused all of this to take place. And I want to share with you just some very simple thoughts tonight on what may have, it may have been and what it could be in our churches today that would cause a church body of people today to so have the Spirit of God move on them that it would shake the city. Principle number one is this. There's got to be members. Look in chapter 1 and verse 15 again. Notice this with me. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren... This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. 
Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst, he, uh, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch that the field is called in their proper tongue, Akladama, uh, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take, and his bishopric let another take, and his bishopric let another take, which means somebody's got to fill the hole. You know what it took for these men to have said about them that their ministry so had the power of God on it that it shook an entire city? There had to be members. There's got to be somebody show up. You know at Faith Baptist Church and at every Baptist church across the entire world today, everybody's got the same testimony. There were some that were among us, but they were not of us. And so today, many times, our testimony is, remember so-and-so, remember whenever they left. But you know, very rarely do we ever give a great praise. Remember when so-and-so left and God sent us them? Oftentimes, our focus is always on the who left instead of on the who came. I'll tell you something, if God's going to move at Faith Baptist Church and a great revival is going to take place, there's got to be members. And there's people all over uh, Salt Lake City, all over Layton, all over Ogden, all over the place that are still looking for a place that God shows up. Found it! And you know what they need to do? They need to be a part. There's got to be members. One preacher many years ago made a statement. I made a little note about this a long time ago and put this in my notes about this passage of Scripture. The church's power lies in her helplessness. I didn't say that. I'm borrowing it. But the church's power still lies in her helplessness. Listen to me. You could put on the biggest rock concert. Yes, there might be thousands of people show up. You could have so-and-so doctor whoever show up and speak and all those great... And yes, there might be thousands of people show up, but they're not going to last except the Holy Spirit bring them in and they've not become a part of it unless the Holy Spirit draws them. You know what's going to take to shake this city today? There's got to be members how do you get members? Well, the Bible tells us about these members. If you keep on reading, you're going to find out these were people who were converted. These members were members that at one time had been a part of a worldly lifestyle, something out there in the world that we have no part in. But that's where they came from, which means that if God's going to send a revival today that's going to happen and bring members into the church, they must first be converted. Somebody's got to reach somebody to make somebody a member. Somebody's got to go out and reach somebody so that somebody can be a church in a foreign land. Somebody's got to convert somebody. When, when, we, when our family, when we were in Iowa, we pastored in a little town in Iowa. In the, in the, in the wintertime, there was probably 2,500 people that stayed in town. In the summertime, because of Black Hawk Lake, there was probably 25,000 people. They had summer homes all around that lake and boats and, and all kinds of stuff all out there and all, and all those things. But our church was the only, number one, the only Baptist church in that entire town community right there. We were it. Now you might think, wow, what a great opportunity to reach people. Let me tell you something. The other people that were not of us, they were of another persuasion. And the other persuasion one day decided to come knock on this Baptist preacher's door. And the higher ups in their persuasion came and knocked on my door and I invited them in very freely and they walked in and they sat down in the chair and I sat down at my desk and I said, how can I help you not knowing who they were? They began to share with me who they were and what they believed and all of that. The number one thing that their complaint with me was this. You're converting our people. I said, actually, I'm not. Your people are being converted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I didn't have any part. The only thing I did was tell him, thus saith the Lord. God did all the rest of it. And you know what? We were seeing people getting saved. They were coming and joining our church. We started having, we had a man that, I mean, he came from a very rough background, walked up with tears flowing down his cheeks, and he said, Pastor, I don't know if this is even allowed in our church, but could I lead the songs? I said, yes. <laughs> his name was Earl. Remember Earl? Earl became our neighbor. And Earl, he, he hung on to some, some of his past. <laughs> he, he had a struggle, but he did. You know what? Earl came out on his front porch one day, and, and I was working out in the, in the yard, and I said, Hey, Brother Earl, how you doing? He said, I don't think you're supposed to call me brother today. I said, Why not? He said, Well, I kind of messed up yesterday. I said, you know, Earl, the cool thing about being a child of God is that once you're saved, you got it, man. Do you know the, the, the cool thing, Earl? I told him, I said, the cool thing, Earl, is that when you became my brother in Christ, that's sealed by God. I don't get to change that. He said, you, you mean it? I said, yeah, I mean it. Do you know that the next Sunday when Earl led the songs, he even moved his arms. <laughs> Earl was the kind of guy that would lead a song like this. Okay, let's all stand and turn to page 175. Let's sing the first, second, and last verse. And he never would look up. I mean, that next Sunday, Earl was standing there, and he had a big grin on his face, missing, missing half of his teeth, you know. He literally had a tooth brush. Just one. That was Earl. And Earl, and when he would say certain words, you could hear the S, you know. He would say, saved by his power divine, Save to new lives. So, and I'd, I'd sit on the front row just so I could listen to the part, you know. And that was Earl. But Earl was sitting there with a big toothy grin, just waving his arm, just having a blast. You know why? Because he'd been converted and he got it. I think that revival will happen today if we see some people become members by conversion. Not join a club, but by the conversion of the Holy Spirit in their life. I think not only were they converted, but I think they're committed. Do you know the word committed means this? It means to devote oneself unreservedly. In other words, no strings attached. You don't get to tell God, now look, I, I'm going to be all in, except for if you don't do this, I'm backing out. You're either in or you're at, or you ain't. I know that's bad English, but I'm saying it anyway. All right? So to be converted and to be committed means it's, there's no reserve. There, there is no, well, I'm only to this limit. But instead, you say, God, I am a part of this family. I am all in in this thing. And you have my commitment fully committed unto you, Christ. I think revival happened. I think that they were members. Got to be members. They were converted. They were committed Here's an example. I don't know the general's name, but there was a general in the army maybe 50 years ago. He led his men on a boat over to an island to take it captive. The crew of men that he had, a couple of hundred men, armed, ready, they watched as that ship drew closer and closer and closer to the sand where they would have to get out and run ashore, preparing mentally for what was about to take place and not knowing truly how it was all going to turn out. And as they got closer and closer to that shore, that captain, that general turns around to those men and he tells them, he says, Now, gentlemen, you get off this boat as fast as you can and I'll meet you on that sand. And he did. They all unpiled out of that boat. They went through the water. They held their guns high. They made it over to that sand and they stopped as if to have a pep rally. The general turned to him and he said this, burn the boats. They said, burn the boats? He said, I said, burn the boats. That's a command. They said, sir, 
What if we don't overthrow these men? How shall we escape if we don't have a boat? He said, I didn't come here to lose this battle. Burn the boat. You know what? There's a whole lot of Christians that still got a boat in their water. You know what it's going to take to see that kind of moving of the Spirit of God once again in our churches today? We're going to have to look back one last time and say, you know what? All that stuff that's held me back, burn the boat. I'm not going back any longer. I'm always going foreign for God. I'm not looking back to go, what if there isn't another way? I'm telling God, I'm all in. I'm a member of this thing. I'm a committed member of this thing. I'm going to be a part of what God is going to do. By the Holy Spirit's power, I'm all in in this thing. Burn the boat! You know what? They won that. Many men left out of that battle rejoicing in the fact that they had won. One man talked to a news reporter and this is what he said. I didn't know if we would win or not. All I knew was that my leader said to burn the boat and that we would. You know, it's not for you to know the times. It's not for you to know the seasons. It's just for you to know, he said, it can happen. So let's burn the boat and let's go on for God. Amen. I believe this. I believe they were close. John chapter 13, I know that Pastor Bickle uses this a lot, and I think it's one of the greatest verses to ever be brought out in John chapter 13. By this shall all men know. If you have love one to another. You know why the power of God so moved on these men? Because they were close enough to have love one to another. It wasn't that they were on the outside saying, yeah, there's a whole group of them over there that are doing a pretty good job. Brother Rod, they were in it. They were close enough in it that they could be a part of it. And I think that what's going to take to shake this city, I think what it, what it could be that Faith Baptist Church could be the very core of revival in this nation today is that we're close enough not only to Jesus Christ but to the children of God today that we're able to stand shoulder to shoulder. You guys ever play, what's that, what's that game that you play with? Red Rover, Red Rover, send so and so right over. You know how to keep them from breaking through uh, that? If you stand close enough that they can't. And I think all too often we've stood back and we've said, Oh, Satan, oh, Satan, send your power right over. And here he comes. You know what it's going to keep to keep him back? It's got to be some Christians that are standing shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow, knee to knee, standing there in the power of God because we're members of this thing. We're converted members of this thing. We're committed members of this thing. And I think we better be close enough that we can be called members of this thing. I think God's power could once again move, and I want to be a part of that. I think not only were there members, but I think there's got to be miracles. Would you look with me in chapter 2? In Acts chapter 2, in verse 2, the Bible says this, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Hey, Brother Russ, here it is. Here's the song. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. I hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet as Gabriel sounds the horn at the midnight cry. Hey, you know what? I don't know really what that all is going to look like. I just know this. I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to be a part of that. And it's close. Man, is it ever close. Don't that make you just want to shout? Why don't you? Hey, we've lost that. We've lost that shout. We need to get that back. 
We ought to get that back. Listen, I think that there ought to be miracles. If we're going to shake a city, got to be some miracles. The Bible says here that the power of God came, and when it came, it says it came as a, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Listen, it came suddenly. It didn't come as, as this little bit of a, of a breeze every now and then. The power, revival's not going to come as this little bit here, little bit there. I think if revival's going to come when God's people become those kind of members and they're committed and they're a part of all of this, I think revival's just going to show up. And when it happens, we're going to say, that's what we've been praying for. That's the kind of moving of the Spirit of God. That's the Holy Spirit moving at Faith Baptist Church. I want to be a part of that. I want to be around when that kind of stuff happens. I think it didn't come little bit by little. I think it came sudden. The Bible says it came sudden. I think it came forcefully too. There's a, I'm, I like, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a YouTuber. You all know what that means? It means that at night when you can't unwind, it means you lay in your bed with your phone and watch YouTube videos. I'm a YouTube. I like to watch YouTube video. I mean, I've laughed at some of the dumbest people. <laughs> I'm telling you what. You can't jump from that building to that building. It's too far. You're going to fall down and break your crown and all the rest of that rhyme. I've laughed at all them kind of, I'm a YouTube, I like to laugh at YouTube videos. I do. I, I watch YouTube videos and all that kind of, you know what I found about, about YouTube videos and how it applies to this? They've got this video about being forceful. I watched it, found it. It's this video about being forceful. And this guy claims, he's a martial artist, he claims that he has such a power in his punch that he doesn't even have to touch you and you'll fall down. And listen, they got a whole interview on this guy. He's going on. And I'm laughing, not at the fact that he believes he can do it, but at the fact that there was TV evangelists years ago been claiming that same thing. <laughs> People falling out all over the oh! You know? I got news for you. You see me at 4 a.m., my breath can do the same thing. I don't even have to touch you. I can say, hi. <laughs> Ask Julie, she'll tell you. Yeah. So the, this, guy, this guy claims this, and so he illustrates it. He, he says, he, he gets these people up in front of him, and he, he gets himself ready for this punch. You know, he's got the right stance, and he's getting ready. I mean, he's going to push from the hip and, and all this, you know, and he, and he stares them down. It's like he's staring right through them, you know, he's, and he tells them what he's going to do. He says, now, here's what I'm going to do. He said, at, at, when, when I say three, I'm going to push my hand, my body is going to put, and I'm going to push so hard that the air between you and me is going to push you so fast that you're just going to fall over. And there was a few people that, you know, he did like that, and they were kind of like bouncing backwards and that kind of thing, until the one guy that missed the day that they were supposed to practice all this showed up, and he walks up, and he's standing there, and he's getting all ready, and I mean, this guy goes to punching in the air, and ain't nothing happening. So then the video cuts off, and then the news reporter says, well, we will cut that off right there, you know, not to make the guy look bad. I got news for you. When revival shows up and the power of God starts moving, it isn't going to come with some guy pushing a little bit. It's going to knock some people off their feet. And I want to be a part of that. I want to be there when the Holy Spirit so moves in somebody's life that it just lifts them up from where they've been, puts them on that rock, that solid rock, and they're able to look back and say, burn the boat, I'm going on for God. I want to be a part of that. I think that not only was these, these miracles were they sudden and forceful, but listen, the Bible says it came to all of them. Did you read that in verse 2? It says in verse 2, it, it says, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. It didn't just reveal itself to a few. It filled the whole entire house, which means to me that if you're going to be a member, you better show up or you ain't going to be in the house when it shows up. 
kind of revival could we see today if young people, you know those young people that you've been talking to, that you've been witness to, and, you, and you've cried about, and you've gone to Brother Rod and said, pray with me about these young people. I want to see their life change. I want them to have the message that God gave me. I want them to be a part of our youth group. Those young people that, that, that just came to your mind and all of that, those are the ones that need to see the power of God so move in you that they want to come and be a part of it. I think it's all, we, we've spent so much time praying that God would send something to somebody else. We forgot to say, Lord, I, I want to be a part of this thing too. I think that if we're going to be a church that shakes a city, there's got to be members. There's got to be miracles. I think the power of God's got to so move. I think this. There's got to be money. We'll look at chapter 2 and verse 45. No, let's go to verse 44. This includes everyone. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. If there's going to be a church that shakes a city, it's got to happen because there's money. There's got to be money. Listen, if we're going to be that kind of church right there, that the Bible says in verse 44, all that believed were together and had all things in common, then what we're also going to have to have in common is we're all going to have to support it. Then there's going to have to be money. Listen, what it takes to be this kind of church is it's got to be sacrificially given. I don't understand how that we could say, God, you must bless, when we ourselves have, have not been willing to sacrifice in order to see the power of God move. Those disciples didn't step back and say, well, I, I, I'm one of the disciples, and so I don't have to do anything. No one said they went out into a community where they were hated, and they shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of them beheaded. Many of them were crucified. Many of them burned. There's got to be a sacrifice in giving. And part of that's money. Missions conference is coming. We're, we've been praying for a year. Our family's been praying for a year. God, we want to see something so miraculous take place in the missions conference at Faith Baptist Church that it literally blows our mind to go, what just happened? How did God do all of that? You know what, you know what it's going to take to see that happen? Money. That's going to be part of it. We're not going to be able to say to missionaries, you know what, we're 100% behind you, except for this one part. I say, this in, I say this not in jest, I say this in all seriousness. The number one problem the missionaries have today is not getting to the field. That guy right there, He's not been in Brazil a long time yet and all that, but I can tell you this already about him. He's going to raise his support. If God wants him in Brazil, he's going to raise his support. That's not the problem. Missionary's problem is not getting to the field. Missionary's problem is staying there. Because a lot of times it's out of sight, out of mind. And God help us that we have so looked into the face of a missionary and said, I, and listen, we had this happen to us just a few weeks back. A pastor made this very statement about our family. Lost, we lost that support, and I'll tell you why. I'm not, I'm not saying this for, 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 our, for that missionary's benefit. Listen, he said, I only pay a missionary per letter that he sent. I told the man, that member of his church that is a friend of ours, when he told, relayed the message to me, I said, then I don't want that support. Because it's not support. It's not a heart for missions. It's not a heart for evangelism. It's a heart to say, well, here's a few dollars now. Go on your merry way. I'm not interested in that. What I want is I want to be a part of the moving of God. The Holy Spirit so moves that the miracle of God so happens in a people that they say this. I'm willing to get behind what God's doing. And if that means that I have got to give sacrificially, I'm going to give sacrificially. How about the widow and her might? You know what Jesus said about her? Some of you have given all this. 
She gave all she had. Listen, it's not about the number. It's about the heart. She gave sacrificially. I think that there's going to have to be money because it's got to come sacrificially, and I think it ought to come liberally. It ought to come liberally. There's going to be missionaries at this missions conference this year that have never experienced Faith Baptist Church. There's going to be a family show up here. There's going to be more than them. There's going to be people that are coming. There's going to be visitors from other churches that have never experienced Faith Baptist Church's missions conference. And they're, when they come in, they're going to listen for what goes on in a missions conference at Faith Baptist Church. And you know what they need to hear? They need to hear that these people, these members are committed and that the miracles of God are going on here and that they are 100% behind those missionaries and they just gave them what? How did that happen? The power of God does that. That's what needs to happen. Because they gave sacrificially. And they gave liberally. And then I think also they gave freely. Nobody had to twist their arm. Oh, wouldn't that be awesome? If you never had to ask people to give. If you never had to preach on the subject of money. If you never had to say as a missionary, please help me get to Brazil. What if all you had to say was, so and so is, has a heart for. And they so freely gave that they said, we want to be a part of that. Let's just do it. If God's in this thing, let's just do it. I want to share one last thing with you tonight, and I'm going to close. Listen, I think that there's got to be members and miracles and money. But lastly, I want to tell you this. There's got to be a mission. Where there is no vision, we're done. The Bible says in that passage of Scripture, listen to this. They went from house to house. Preaching that. They didn't wait for a missions conference. They didn't wait till the end of the year. They didn't wait for the new season. Listen, they did this every day. This was so much a part of their heart that they said, I've got to tell somebody what God's doing. And if that means that I die, I die. And if that means that I stand in the face of every other denomination in the world and I have to proclaim, thus saith the Lord, then I'll do it by myself. And if that means that even some that were with us but they were not of us, if that means that they leave, I'm still going to praise God for who He sent. Because I want to be a part of the church that shakes the city. This is the year to do it. You say, how do you know this is the year to do it? Because you got no promise of another one. And if you don't know you're going to be here next year, then you better get all in this year. Because when that trumpet sounds, you don't want to be standing and saying, I had good intentions, God, of next year, and you came too early. It ought to be, God, I was all in before you got there. And now you've still got all of me. Hey, church, listen to me. We love you. We would not be right in the eyes of God if we did not tell you from our heart and that missionary and every other missionary on the planet and every other evangelist and every other pastor, if you want to add them in too. Listen, we're just waiting to see who's going to take us up on the offer of being the church to shake a city. And if it's not going to be you, I'm going to go to another church and I'm going to tell them the same message. Would you like to be the church that could shake a city? And if it's not them, we're going to go to the next one and we're going to say, how about you? Because we've got to find somebody that's so in that they say, that's me. That's me. And I believe it's Faith Baptist Church. I've seen it happen. And I think tonight there's somebody that in their heart of hearts would have to admit, I haven't really prayed that way. 
and I need to. And I think that there's somebody that says, you know what, I've been praying that for so long, I'm so ready. <laughs> I just want to see God do it. I want to anticipate God this year more than ever before. And I think he'll do something awesome. Would you stand with me tonight?